Welcome to our worship service here at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Obelisk. My name is Amy, Pastor Amy Smith, and it's my joy to be the pastor here at St. Luke's. We're glad that you can join us today for our worship service. Just a few quick announcements before we get started. First of all, uh, I want to make you aware of an important date. On May 7th, I will be installed here as, a pa as the permanent pastor at St. Luke's. That service is after our, that is a Sunday, that service is after our two regular worship services at 8 and 9.15. The installation service will be led by Pastor Chris McKinstry from St. James over in Limerick. He's the conference dean in this area. So he'll be leading the service that begins at one o'clock. All are welcome. There will be light refreshments afterwards. Um, it's been a long time since there's been an installed pastor at this church. So this is very much a joyous day for us here at St. Luke's. My next announcement is to share with you that June Fest is in full swing. The preparations for that are absolutely underway. If you have something that you would like to donate that we can sell at June Fest, please let us know. We are happy to, uh, to make arrangements to, to help you get that to us. We use the money that we raise at June Fest to uh, fund our mission here at St. Luke's. So we look forward to a very, very good weekend there. And the final announcement I have for you is that on June, I'm sorry, on April 29th, we will be having a brainstorming session and we're inviting all of the congregation to come and spend some time with uh, with us trying to think of ways that we can best utilize all of the resources that we have here at St. Luke's to better serve our community. That brainstorming session is going to be led by our council president, Clark, and it begins on Saturday the 29th at 9 a.m. over in Fellowship Hall. So I hope that you can join us there. If you're unable to join us in person and you would like to share some of your thoughts, please feel free to get in touch with me at the church office. I'd love to hear what you're thinking. And with that, 
Let us begin our worship service with thanksgiving for baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose hand we are given new birth, by whose speaking we are given new life. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are welcomed, restored, and supported as citizens of the new creation. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and mighty, you are the river of life. You are the everlasting wellspring. In mercy and might, you have freed us from death and raised us with Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. In baptismal waters, our old life is washed away, and in them we are born anew. Glory to you for oceans and lakes, for rivers and streams. Honor to you for the waters that wash us clean, quench our thirst, and nurture both crops and creatures. Praise to you for the life-giving water of baptism, the outpouring of the spirit of the new creation. Wash away our sin and all that separates us from you. Empower our witness to your resurrection. Strengthen our resolve in seeking justice for all. Satisfy the world's need through this living water. Where drought dries the earth, bring refreshment. Where despair prevails, grant hope. Where chaos reigns, bring peace. We ask this through Christ, who with you and the Spirit reigns forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, beloved children of God, grace, mercy, and peace be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, your Son makes himself known to all his disciples in the breaking of the bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may see him in his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is Acts 2. Uh, verse 14a and then 36 through 41. Peter standing with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah. This Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this they were cut to heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles brothers what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that you so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you, your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Here is the reading. The responsive reading is Psalm 116, uh, verses 1 through 4, and then 12 through 19. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. For the Lord has given ear to me whenever I called. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray to you, save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things God has done for me? I will lift the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. Precious in your sight, O Lord, is the death of your servants. O Lord, truly, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. 
I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. In the court of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. The second reading is 1 Peter uh, 1, verses 17 through 23. If you invoke as Father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with the perishable thing like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before foundations of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are now set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love for one another deeply from the heart, you have been born anew, not of perishable, but imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. Here is the reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now on that same day, when Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene, two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. One of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of, of, of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and beside all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them to he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, "Stay with us because it's almost evening." and the day is nearly over now. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, were our hearts not burning within us? when he was talking to us on the road while, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord is risen and he has, and he has appeared to Simon. 
Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the risen, the risen Christ. I must admit, I have been wrestling with this text for the last several days. Now, it's not a complicated text. It just had me chasing my own tail for a while. I kept wanting to write about one thing, but it wasn't flowing, and I ended up with another idea altogether. In seminary, they call that interacting with the Holy Spirit. They tell you it's really pointless to wrestle with the Holy Spirit. Just let the Holy Spirit lead you where it wants you to go. So let me set the scene of, of our reading today. We have two people, one named Cleopas, and the other is unnamed, and they're walking down the road, leaving Jerusalem, heading towards the town of Emmaus, which is about a seven-mile walk. And they are described as disciples, but they are not from the original group of 12 that we know. In this case, the word disciple is being used to describe them as followers of Jesus. We actually have no idea who these two are. The name Cleopas never appeared in the New Testament before this reading and is never heard from again in any text after this passage. And there's no indication at all of who Cleopas' traveling companion was. Some biblical scholars actually argue that it might have been Cleopas' wife because of the hospitality that they offer Jesus at the end of the day when they invite him to rest with them. So it's the afternoon of the first Easter day, and these two followers of Jesus are walking toward Emmaus. They were upset and sad and talking about the events of the past three days. Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, begins to walk with them and asks them what it is they're discussing. The interesting thing here is Cleopas and his companion, though they were followers of Jesus in Jer and in Jerusalem during the crucifixion, neither of them recognized Jesus. What it says in the reading is their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And that was the first thing that jumped out to me at this reading. Why were they kept from recognizing him? Why would that happen? Last week when we read about Doubting Thomas and how he wouldn't take the word of the other disciples who had seen Jesus and testified to the fact that he had indeed been resurrected, he wouldn't listen to the women who had reported that the tomb was empty and that Jesus had appeared to them. No, Thomas needed to see for himself. And not only see, but Thomas also said he needed to stick his fingers in the holes in Jesus' hand and in the hole in his side. And when Jesus finally appeared to Thomas, he didn't scold Thomas for his doubt. Jesus invited him to have the proof that he said he needed. Jesus shows up time and time again after his resurrection and before his ascension into heaven to offer his followers what they need to believe and make sense of what is happening. There's no judgment and there's no belittling. There is only patience and love and understanding. So why were Cleopas and his companion kept from recognizing Jesus? Let's look at what happens immediately after Jesus has joined them, but they don't recognize him. Jesus asks them what they're talking about, and they are quite surprised and honestly a little bit snippy that he wasn't aware of the events of the past three days. They tell Jesus about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a great prophet, mighty in word and deed before God, who had been betrayed by the chief priest and crucified and, was, and died. They even knew and shared 
with Jesus that his tomb had been found empty that very morning. They also admitted their disappointment because they had been hopeful that this Jesus the Nazarene would be the one to redeem Israel. Now after Cleopas and the others shared all of this with their new traveling companion, they were then treated to some teaching from Jesus who they still didn't recognize. Jesus ran through the references from the ancient Jewish texts, the, the Old Testament, where it was prophesied that the Messiah would come, beginning with Moses and running through all the writings of the prophets, prophets, Jesus told the two why the events of the past three days had to take place. They admit later that their hearts were burning within them as Jesus spoke and opened the scriptures to them. This stranger, their new friend, the resurrected Jesus that they don't yet recognize, was sharing the word with them, telling the story to others as the followers of Jesus, like them, would be called on to do from that day forward as we are all called to do. Our reading goes on. The three travelers stop for the evening. They begin to share their meal, and as Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, and after he broke it, Cleopas and his companion have their eyes open, and they recognize Jesus. And as soon as they recognize him, he disappears. They jump up. And despite it being late, they head back to Jerusalem, find the disciples, and tell them what they've seen. And the disciples affirm what they're saying with stories of their own sightings. They say, he appeared to Simon too. It's real. The Lord has risen. Many hearts burned with the news that day. And the word began to spread the very day Jesus left the tomb. This is a great story. Why did I wrestle with it so much earlier this week? Originally, I kept focusing on the question of why Cleopas and the other were kept from seeing Jesus. I found myself wondering, how many times have I walked with Jesus and didn't recognize him? Have I actually had long talks with Jesus and not recognized his face? Have all of us? I don't know if I ever have, but I do know this. Every time you talk with someone, you are talking with the beloved child of God. Whether you like them or not, respect them or not, lift them up or tear them down, you are doing that to a beloved child of God, someone made in God's image. What would the world be like if we always behaved as if the person across from us looked like Jesus to us? Well, I think this thought alone is reason enough to love this story. I don't think it captures the bigger picture here. This is a story about sharing the word what we now know as the gospel, this is a story of evangelism and sharing the word. At the beginning of this re reading, Cleopas and his companion share the story of Jesus with their new friend they met on the road to Emmaus. Their new friend shares the word words of scriptures from the prophets, the Old Testament, shares those words with them, relating the events of that day and the three days prior and igniting a fire in their hearts. In the end, they hurry back to Jerusalem and share the word of seeing the risen Jesus with the disciples, and the disciples share the word of their own meetings with Jesus. The gospel was shared back and forth, person to person, the story of the life, death, and resurrection was told. The gospel was shared. 
I believe I wrestled with this text so much because I kept trying to overthink it. Now that's not at all unusual. If there's a way to overthink something, I will find it and happily do that. But a story I read this week brought me back to the simple essence of this passage. It's about telling the story, sharing what we now know as the gospel. Well, here's the story. There was a student in seminary, and that student was taking the preaching class. And they were assigned to preach in chapel the next day. The student worked and worked all night long, giving it their best effort. But when chapel started, they had no sermon prepared. So when the time came, the student climbed into the pulpit and said to the congregation, do you know what I'm going to say? The surprised congregation looked at the student and shook their head and said, no. And the student said to them, neither do I. The, ser the service is over. Go in peace. The professor of the preaching class rushed over to the student and said, yeah, not funny. You are going to preach again tomorrow. Have a sermon ready. The student goes home, works diligently all night, trying to get a sermon together for the next day. At chapel, the student again climbs into the pulpit and says to the congregation, do you know what I'm going to say? Yeah, they all happily nod their heads. We do know what you're going to say. To which the student replies, then I don't need to tell you. The service is over. Go in peace. Now the preaching prof class professor is livid. He tells the student, you have one more chance. Preach the gospel tomorrow or find another seminary. So the next day at chapel, the student enters the pulpit again and says to the congregation, do you know what I'm going to say to you? Now the congregation isn't quite sure what to think, so some of them shake their head no, and some of them nod their head yes. Good, the student says. Now those of you who know, tell the ones that don't know. The service is over. Go in peace. The professor comes up to the student, puts his arm around the student's shoulder, and says, those of you who know, Tell the ones that don't know. The gospel has been preached here today. Those who know, tell the ones that don't know. We don't need to overthink it. That is how the gospel is preached. That is how the word is spread. That's what our reading is about today. And that is the lesson for us. Those of us who know are to tell the ones who don't know. Through word or through deed, our job, our joy, is that as followers of Jesus, we get to tell this wonderful story. Amen. Let us continue our worship service by confessing our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Ever-present God, you, made your, you make yourself known in the breaking of the bread and in the bonds of community. Reveal yourself to us in the faces of all we meet. Strengthen, strengthened by your body and blood, let us boldly live out your good news. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we know you in the breaking of the bread, we know you in the grains of the field and the flowing waters. Care for the earth you lovingly create. Strengthen those who safeguard threaten land and water. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are the authority to whom we dedicate our lives. Help us keep the needs of those most vulnerable at the forefront of our community. Move us to care for any who are disregarded or oppressed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mothering God, you feed and comfort those who hunger. Open the hearts of those who hoard resources and lead them to share your abundance. We pray for anyone hungering for your comforting presence this day. We pray for all those on our prayer list and those that we lift before you now in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You pour out your love on those who are oppressed. Support and comfort anyone who is marginalized by gender or identity and those whose stories are not believed. Form this community to listen faithfully and speak honestly in our ministry together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember with thanksgiving all your beloved saints. As you have raised them to eternal life, abide with us in your promise of resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praises to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and also with you. Let us pray. Generous God, in this meal you offer your very self. We give thanks for those gifts of the earth. In the breaking of the bread, reveal to us the risen one. In the pouring out of this wine, pour, out, pour us out in the service to the world. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. Brought together as one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive God's blessing. The God of all who raised Jesus from the dead bless you by the power of the Holy Spirit to live in the new creation. Amen.
Go in peace, serve the risen one. Thanks be to God.